Hi, it's Anna. Welcome back to Books on the Go. Um, I thought I'd just do a Women in Translation Month check-in because I have I know that I'm not on schedule and the readathon I think is happening later this month. But I had a window. I was ahead with the podcast reading, and so I just started reading. I was really wanting to get to some of my Women in Translation books, so I inadvertently went onto a roll and ended up reading five um, so I'm really um, impressed with myself so I just wanted to share them while they're fresh so the first one was Tokyo Ueno Station by Yu Miri translated by Morgan Giles which is a Tilted Axis Press book and I've been super excited to read this it's set in Tokyo um, it's told it's the point of view of a homeless man who's elderly and reflecting back on his life and part of that was that he went to work on a the construction site for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics and then that dovetails into the upcoming 2020 Olympics but I didn't get on with this one unfortunately I really wanted to love it and it was just a bit bleak and I know that sounds terrible it's from the point of view of this elderly man he's homeless and I think that is done with great compassion and it I, it really does give you a sense of life in Tokyo that might not be what you expect when you think of Tokyo and might not be indeed what you see in other literature from Japan and so I appreciated that and he then reflects back on his life, but it's quite, oh, what's the word I want to use? The pace is quite slow and it doesn't feel, it didn't to me feel like it was building or that there was dramatic tension or it was, um, it just seemed episodic or matter of fact, the, the tone is matter of fact, so I think that didn't help. Obviously, we, we, you can glean from the fact that he's now, homeless living in the park that you know things that were happening were not great and so sad things were happening and he narrates it in this almost a monotone and that is in that's fitting when you consider he's probably you know he's living in these terrible circumstances not to say that he's really down about the park like he does observe um, life in the park and amongst his community and juxtapose that with visitors and people who are walking past with first world problems and I, I liked that so it's not all um, doom and gloom from his perspective but you know you can tell that um, the episodes that he's reflecting on are not necessarily happy ones um, but in any case I just didn't it failed the test for me of when it was sitting on the table do I want to get back to it? Am I looking forward to picking it up? And I just wasn't. And so I left this about halfway through. So I don't know if I can count that for Women in Translation. It just wasn't for me, but I'm really, um, I will look out for you, Miri, and I'll still really buy anything that Tilted Axis publishes because um, I love their translations and the fact that they go into they seem to cover Asian countries that I don't often find literature in translation. So um, certainly a publisher to look out for. And I would be interested if anyone has read this, what you thought of it and whether it you know, gets better. And I might have missed something that happens later in the book, but um, I just put it aside. So that was Tokyo Ueno Station. And then another one that I didn't love and that is the white book by Han Kang. So Han Kang is the South Korean author and sorry translated by Deborah Smith. Han Kang wrote and Deborah Smith translated The Vegetarian which I think won the then as it was then Man Booker International Prize in about 2016 I want to say um, and I liked that. I wouldn't say I loved that but I thought it was so original and visceral and a powerful small novel that was unlike anything I had read so I was intrigued by this it's very different um, and it takes as its uh, I don't know if inspiration is the word but it seems to be drawn from the real life experience where Hank Hang's mother 
lost a baby um, or a baby died before Han Kang was born. So she had a, a sister who died um, as a baby. And I, f I, I don't know if it's autobiographical, but it read that way to me because of the style, which is like a series of vignettes or essays. Um, it very much read like a um, autobiographical reflections. So I don't know if that is the case. I think she has called it a novel. Um, it certainly didn't read like a novel to me. And I think it would work really. I mean, each vignette is very delicate and very simple and beautiful and often sad. It has a melancholy tone. Um, and that would work really well if maybe if you read one or two a day and almost as a meditation and there's a, a beauty in the in the simplicity of them and the fact they just make you stop and think about small things like uh, white things is is the jumping off point she makes a list of white things um, so swaddling bands newborn gown salt snow so that could work, but for me, I'm just too impatient as a reader and it, it, that wasn't enough to, to really, for me to enjoy it. So I, I sort of bailed and then I went back and read through sort of quickly just to, yeah, just to get more of a sense of it. But this wasn't one for me, but I, I do really admire Hang Kang. So that was the white book and I just had, I'd bought it ages ago and it's been sitting on my shelf. So I had been really intrigued but hesitant to, to read it. So now I have. Then I read Asleep by Banana Yoshimoto, who's an author that I've loved her work that I have read, which was Kitchen and the Lake. And this is three short stories and they all have a theme where one of the characters is either sleeping or night walking or drinking or sort of numbing themselves somehow to deal with a loss. Um, so in the first one, the narrator, has uh, her brother has died and she has a friendship with her cousin and together they're thinking back to the time when her brother was alive and um, his relationship with their cousin. The second one is a young woman who is drinking a lot and thinking back to a relationship where she was in a living with another woman and they shared a boyfriend effectively. And then the third one, which is called Asleep, is a young woman who sleeps all the time and she has an older boyfriend and she can't bring herself to tell him that a, a friend of hers has died and she's then remembering her friend and her friend had a job where she was like a prostitute but all she would do was sleep next to um, the, her clients, the men who would come to see her. And so there's certainly a theme running through and it makes you think about the different ways that sleep can be, um, you know, that you're shutting yourself off from the world. Uh, and I love the clarity of her prose. It's really clean, it's simple. Um, and she does this thing where it's very matter of fact where in a way that if characters are eccentric or diverse it just is very accepting there's never an issue about that which I really like um, and her tone's very engaging so it feels as if they're just confiding in you it's very conversational and somehow she writes about things that are everyday details, like they'll have a conversation or they'll go out or something in their day to day and and yet it's not boring. And I'm not sure how she does that, but it's very, at times, really poetic. Um, and she doesn't focus on the dramatic events like the actual death or the tragedy that is the the major drama of the story, but she focuses more on the characters um, quiet their sort of strength in coping with it and this quiet strength that they have and there's a beautiful quote right near the end and she says oh, even if all this has been nothing but the story of a few small waves that shook me when I lost my friend and wore myself out doing all the little things one does every day even if all this was nothing but the story of a small resurrection, it still makes me think that people are very strong. 
And so I just found that really sweet and poignant. And yeah, I just, um, there's something beguiling about her prose, which I really like. So that's Asleep. And then I went to France. So I have Fire in the Blood by Irene Nemirovsky, who was actually Ukrainian, but living in uh, Paris. And then just before the German invasion, she and her husband moved to a rural village in, I think, Burgundy. And this was written at least partly during that time, which was about 1940, 1941, and possibly even into 1942. Um, so it's amazing to think she was still writing then. And she'd written a novel a year for from 1928 to 1937. And it said, there's a little note, there's a foreword um, where it talks about Irene Nemirovsky's life. And something that amazed me was her husband worked at a bank and he earned a third of what she did. And she was a writer. And I just thought that was amazing. When you consider in this day and age um, that, a, you know, you'd be out out earning your banker partner as an author um, threefold is quite amazing. So she was really a rock star author in her day. And this is a beautiful small novel. It's again, deceptively simple. It's just the story of Silvio as the narrator and he's telling the story of his cousin's family and they, they are Paisan or I don't know if that's exactly the pronunciation, but they're farmer people in rural France and um, there's a note by Sandra Smith sorry I should have said the translator this one is Sandra Smith and the sleep was Michael Emmerich and there's a note by Sandra Smith saying the word paysan has a really particular meaning it's quite nuanced and so they're not bourgeoisie but they're not working class and they're a proud people and very much rooted in the land. People that were living in those parts of France uh, during that time and Irene Nemirovsky having been there had observed them closely and um, so that's who we're, we're with in the story and it's his cousin's family and his cousin is this really lovely wife. She's married and a really good mother and a really good wife and they have a daughter Colette um, and so events happen and she does this clever thing where she moves you through the years quite efficiently with this really lovely, elegant, uh, almost curation of the episodes and, and events in their lives that tell you enough to, to understand the story. So maybe if someone's ill, she'll tell you so-and-so's ill and then the next chapter you know he's died and then it will skip through a few years and Silvio goes to visit one of his cousins um, and there's a death which is probably you know the most dramatic moment it all seems to be okay but then the tension builds and builds and you realize that the family is going it, that some secrets will be exposed and it ends up being really almost philosophical in that it makes you think about um, well, not just families and what goes on behind closed doors, but also is it better to be really dutiful and is the better person the one who's done the right, the sort of right thing and fulfilled all these obligations and been sensible or is it better to be more hedonistic and live in the moment? And Silvio, you know, asks that question and I found that really interesting and it's very much, you know, there's beautiful sense of time and place and setting but I found that the sort of themes and the dynamics of the family you could almost set it in modern day New York for example and have similar things playing out so it's really um, universal in that way so a really beautiful very small novel uh, that's quite a quick read and that's Fire in the Blood and then I read this lovely surprise, which is still in France, Our Life in the Forest by Mari Dariusek, and it's translated by Penny Houston. This was not something I expected to like, but it was the tone that I loved in this one and the sense of humour. So it's dystopian set in the near future. So immediately, that's not my favourite genre um, but the narrator is in a forest 
and she starts to tell you about how she came to be there and what life has been like before that. Um, so she's been living in the city and in this almost handmaid's tale where other clones of her or other humans have been bred and kept to uh, provide spare body parts or transfusions if you get sick. Um, and so it's sort of horrific and yet a bit like handmaid's, The Handmaid's Tale, it's not that far removed from what could be possible in the future. So it has that, that dystopian element. And it was what I loved about it though was the way she tells it. She's very cynical, um, very funny, and you know still vulnerable as well. So there's a really interesting tone and it keeps you turning the page. Again, it's not very long and there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to do with artificial intelligence and what should we use technology for and you know, should humans prolong their lives and all sorts of things that also came up in Frankenstein, which I read recently, and uh, Murmur by Will Eaves. So I feel like I've inadvertently uh, struck on a theme of artificial intelligence, but um, this one was in a completely different, done in a very different way. So I really recommend this. It was a complete discovery for me, and I haven't read Murray Dariusek before, but I would definitely seek out more of her work. And so that is our life in the forest. So that's it from me. That's my Women in Translation check-in. Um, let me know what you've been reading. The one, one thing I remembered uh, from the prompts, because last time I'd forgotten what all of the prompts were for the readathon, um, hosted by, I think, Kendra and Matthew, was the Kyung Suk Shin book. Or well, there were two books that are optional to read, and one of them was one by Kyung Suk Shin. So I went today, couldn't find it at our local bookstore, but I think I'll order that one. So that's an addition to my TBR. And I'll keep you posted. Let me know if you've been doing Women in Translation Month and any recommendations, and I'll see you soon. Bye.